at the outset uh, uh, from the nes of india we would like to pay our uh, tributes uh, to the martyrs who lost their lives uh, uh, a few days ago they were not just defending a piece of land of india they were actually defending the idea of free speech they were defending the idea of pluralism and an idea of an equal society and uh, we take this opportunity and it is our duty to pay our tributes to them now without wasting much time i'll uh, go ahead with uh, starting the proceedings thank you dr pavan and uh, dr narendra suratwal and everybody in the nes team for uh, uh, providing this opportunity and this privilege of uh, uh, moderating a session by none other than uh, professor grants okay dr gans actually needs no introduction but then i'll have to do the uh, introduction okay he is the founder and executive director of the american institute of balance it is one of the largest balance centers not just in usa but across the globe okay uh, he is a phd from ohio state state university in audio auditory and vestibular physiology he has been a leader not just in the development of vestibular evaluation and rehabilitation techniques but also in as a teacher okay there are innumerable number of people who have undergone training under him Okay. and then there is a lot of work that he has he has published books he has published uh, papers and uh, his multiple book chapters he has published and there is one more book that is going to come evaluation and management of balance disorders both in children and adults which we need to be waiting so uh, he his work encompasses from pediatrics to psychiatric aspects of disease all age groups everything and uh, uh, he knows what is a successful balance practice is both from the practitioner's perspective and from the patient's perspective so i uh, now uh, request dr gans to uh, speak uh, to all of us a lot of us are waiting with uh, anticipation to uh, uh, listen to uh, dr gans uh, talk on the rehabilitation techniques okay please post your uh, uh questions in the chat box we'll make a note of all of them and then we'll ask uh, those questions specific questions in the end okay i also take this opportunity to uh, um, welcome uh, my co panelists dr prem sagar from all india institute of uh, medical sciences okay dr amit who is from uh, aims jodhpur and also dr uh, anita bandari okay she is a neurotologist okay uh, innovator and uh, uh, and and a key leader and key opinion leader when it comes to vestibular disorders okay so dr anita bandari from jaipur i this is my privilege to welcome both of you dr prem sagar and dr anita bandari over to dr gans now all right yes. wonderful you can share your screen sir yeah you can yeah. share your screen now yeah, yeah. ready okay There we go. That's right. Well, uh, first of all, let me thank uh, NES and its leadership. It was my great honor to to be with you all in Jodhpur several years ago. So, uh, thank you again for the invitation, and to our friends all over the world, it's always wonderful uh, to be able to be with you, even if it's through a Zoom call. And hopefully, uh, wherever it is. uh very shortly we'll be able to see each other again in person so let's go ahead and get started uh also let me remind you uh it will be on my last slide but if you go to the website dizzy.com uh you will have free open access to all of my textbook chapters all of my publications all of my video case studies it's free it's open access you don't need to log in or or anything uh we've had about four or five uh publications come out just in the last 6 months just one today i think so they're all online for you so let's go ahead and get started oh, let's move my slide now oh. why aren't i there we go 
Okay, so one of the things that I like to talk about is the fact that equilibrium is a birth to earth aspect, right? The vestibular system is our first sensory system to develop. So we have to understand that there are over 500 syndromes, non-syndromes, mitochondrial disorders that have audio-vestibular expressivity, and actually they have more vestibular expressivity. When we talk about children being born with bilateral vestibular dysfunction, we're really talking about uh, habilitation rather than rehabilitation. But today we're going to focus across the lifespan on individuals that have an acquired unilateral or bilateral condition and how we approach uh, their treatment. We know that from birth through the middle ages, through old age, there are many, many medical conditions, comorbidities that will affect the vestibular system. Things like hypertension, diabetes, head trauma, vestibular migraine. So we have to realize that we are never really treating the ear itself. Unlike our colleagues uh, in otology, neurotology, medical ENT, they're really treating the disease and disorder. What we're doing with vestibular rehabilitation is the non-medical, non-surgical management of what oftentimes is a chronic or debilitating condition. Now, at the Institute, we use an interdisciplinary approach. Now, what that means is we have a combination of high-level diagnostic testing. So we have dynamic posturography, uh, vestibular evoked myogenic potentials, video head impulse, rotary chair. We both basically have every test that exists. Right? But we also have a team of outstanding physiotherapists. And so before we make a recommendation uh, based on electrophysiologic tests alone, we always want our physiotherapy team to also evaluate the patient. Because remember, Patients never walk into your clinic on their ears, right? You've never seen anybody walking into your clinic on their ears. So we have to be very, very cognizant of the biomechanical aspects of this particular person. So our physical therapists are going to do their evaluation before we begin our process of therapy. Now, what we also know is there are three primary silos of dysfunction. First is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. We're not really going to talk about that today because we don't need the brain to be involved in the management of BPPV. We might need our brain and our hands but there's no central compensation aspect. Uh, we just published a paper, uh, I think a month ago, and I suggest that we look at BBBV and acquired vestibulopathy, similar to what we do when we look at a mixed hearing loss. So BBBV is really almost like a conductive hearing loss. It's mechanical. When we evacuate the debris, out of the involved canals, for the most part, the patient is, if you will, cured, right? Now, they may have some other overarching conditions, like an uncompensated vestibulopathy, but if it's nothing more than BPPV, that's all they have. So when we talk about vestibular rehabilitation, we're really talking about an acquired unilateral, or acquired bilateral. Now, we often think of bilateral conditions being just, well, maybe it's due to 
uh, atherosclerotic changes, systemic changes. Uh, but the reality of it is that we, uh, we published a paper um, in seminars and hearing uh, about a year ago looking at vestibulotoxicity. So right now, the leading cause of bilateral vestibular function are survivors of cisplatin in chemotherapy uh, for the successful treatment of cancers. So we have to understand that there's a growing group of patients that also have, if you will, somewhat of a sudden onset BVD. So this is a, a challenging population, but one we have to be aware is increasing in prevalence. So who is our best candidate for VRT? Well, basically it's someone who's kind of in a chronic state, meaning they're no longer having the acute debilitating attacks. Now, while there may be some anecdotal data to suggest that a Meniere's patient prior to getting a gentamicin ablation might actually benefit from some VRT, the reality of it is there's no data to suggest that VRT is going to stop somebody from having Meniere's attack or recurrent vestibular neuritis. So again, we want to predominantly focus on patients that no longer are in the acute phase. So these patients are left with a chronic disconnect, if you will, from the moving or dynamic world. They tend to tell you, well, if I'm holding still, if I'm not moving, if the world is not coming at me, if I don't see a lot of moving activities, I can go upstairs, but I can't go downstairs. I can go up an escalator, but I can't go down an escalator. So they begin to develop a wide variety of intolerances to the dynamic, either movement or visually provoked world. Oftentimes, very usually, there is a gain problem in the vestibular ocular reflex, right? It should be one-to-one. -one. For every one degree of head movement, there should be an equal and opposite eye movement. They don't have this. So they actually usually have low gain, high phase, which means their eyes don't move far enough but they move a little too fast. So what that does is it creates blurred vision with head movement. But remember, by the time these people see you, they've probably already partially compensated. So we need to think about compensation more like a dimmer switch and not like a light switch. So they may be partially compensated, which means they're better than they were a week or two after the event but they're still not quite normal. So some of the goals that we have to do, and what is a basic tenet of medicine? Do no harm. So what can we do to make sure that the patient is safe, even in their own home, let alone going out into the street, into the markets, in a very dynamic world? What can we do, particularly for our older adults, to make sure that that center of mass can stay properly over their base of support, particularly during ambulation. That's why we have to be very, very careful with tests of static balance, because tests of static balance don't necessarily extrapolate to what happens when somebody has to walk, particularly when they have to walk, move their head, and be on a dynamic surface. This can be very challenging. What about the safety of just getting on and off a toilet commode, getting in and out of bed, getting in and out of a chair? Remember, when most of our older adults fall, they're going to fall in either the bathroom or the kitchen. Why is that so challenging? Because those are the two rooms in someone's house where the surfaces 
tend to be very, very hard. And the person's head is a lot softer than the concrete floor. We also have to understand about what we call activities of daily living, particularly with our older patients or any patients that have other complicating comorbidities. Remember, most of our patients, although we can see children, most of our patients are going to have impairment of the other modalities affecting balance, vision and touch. So for example, remember we were just talking about uh, cisplatin or chemotherapy? Well, what's one of the side effects? Neuropathy, neuropathy of the lower extremities, right? And so if the person might also be diabetic, they might have a retinopathy, they might have peripheral neuropathy, they might have peripheral arterial disease. So this idea that vestibular rehabilitation is from the neck up only, because we're only focused on central compensation, is too much myopic. We have to look at the gestalt. We have to look at the totality of this patient who's a human being and not just a caloric weakness or not just an absent vamp. An absent vamp or a caloric weakness doesn't tell you what this patient needs as a human being. We also have many standardized assessments that don't even require electricity. So if you don't have a rotary chair, if you don't have video head impulse test, you can still look at some functional impairments of balance using things like the timed up and go test the dynamic gait index. These are standardized assessment tools that require no equipment, not even electricity. All you need is a stopwatch or a second hand on your, on your watch. And then from all of this, from the totality of our electrophysiological tests, from our uh, physical therapy, physiotherapy assessment, we're going to have a plan of care for this patient. If you use a broad brush and just use, oh, well, it's a vestibular patient, these are the exercises I do. Will you help the patient? Maybe. Every patient is an N of one. Every patient is a unique individual. So if you think you can use just a template that you give to everyone, you're going to be doing the patient a disservice and they, you will not be able to produce the outcomes you need. Now, the other thing is you see on the screen four silos. Will the patient only be in one silo? Absolutely not. The patient may need to be in more than one silo, maybe all four silos, depending on the integrity of the other sensory modalities. It's critically important to know, does the patient have neuropathy? What is the status of their biomechanics? What is their uh, orthopedic issue? What is their muscular conditioning? Have they had falls? All these other kind of issues. We also need to understand what are their actual complaints? Right? What are we trying to eliminate, extinguish, or enhance? What is the unique characteristics of this patient? A patient who says, well, I'm, I'm dizzy. What makes you dizzy? Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm dizzy from, from the time I get up in the morning till the time, maybe an hour before bedtime, I, my head starts to clear. Does movement make it worse? Oh no, uh, when you look at things, does that make it worse? Oh no, what makes it better? Well, sometimes if I take a piece of bread, I feel a little bit better. Would you consider that a vestibular patient? What kind of management technique will you use? 
Not everybody with imbalance has vestibular loss or dysfunction. Remember, if you have glaucoma, low vision, a retinopathy, and peripheral neuropathy, you could have the inner ear function of an astronaut and still have imbalance. What is the best recourse and treatment protocol going to be? So again, we want to understand what are the triggers that provoke any of these symptoms? And do the triggers sound vestibular? We need to remind ourselves that a cardinal indicator of an uncompensated UVD or BVD is oscillopsia. The patient obviously is not gonna say, you know, doctor, I think I have some oscillopsia. They're not gonna say that. What'll they say? Oh, my glasses, I, I, you know, they fit me with these bifocals. I, I, I was doing fine, but now I can't get used to them. I feel like my eyes need shock absorbers. How do you feel when you hold still? Oh, I'm okay. It's only when I'm moving or I'm walking. Well, that's a cardinal indicator of a VOR deficit. What about descending motor track? I'm not dizzy. I don't have vertigo, but I'm not sure footed. I don't do well in the dark. I feel like I, I have to touch something to move around, right? that may or may not indicate any vestibular dysfunction. So we have to make decisions about these patients. Do we do everything with them? And the answer is, it depends. But very often, when you take the patient's history, and based on the time you have to spend and the other factors, you make decisions about what tests, what evaluation techniques are going to give you the best and most sensitive findings. Because at the end of the day, usually these patients have had their imaging, they've been through the excellent care of ENT, neurology, neurotology. Now it's about doing what? It's about finding out what type of therapy is going to give this person the best quality of life. We're no longer making a medical diagnosis. We have to come up with what we call a diagnosis-based strategies. What are the functional impairments that are making this person's life less than wonderful? And what can we do to bring them back from being debilitated to being normal? So it's important at this point to really have what I call clinical pathways so that when you sit with a patient and begin to have this conversation, the medical diagnosis has been done. It's not a tumor. It's not cancer, right? There's nothing to treat medically or surgically. You're going to have to use a therapeutic protocol. Mm -hmm. But in order to do that, what are their symptoms? What are the provocative situations, right? Am I, do I need to treat gain problems in the VOR? Do I need to deal with uh, other sensory modalities? And what other evaluation techniques can I use? Outcomes, outcomes, outcomes. If you didn't measure it, it didn't happen. So we're never going to discharge a patient from our care without measuring that our treatment has been effective. Oh, the patient says they feel fine. That's not an outcome. I, I'll give you an example. I was originally trained by NASA in the Air Force, working with pilots and astronauts coming back from the shuttle missions in the early 1980s. The shuttle started in the late 70s. Guess what? The last person you trust is a pilot or an astronaut because they will fake it, right? And today we still work with pilots uh, at the Air Force bases here in Tampa, Florida, okay? You have to be able to measure the outcomes. 
How someone's feeling is great, right? DHI, other subjective, we've published quite a bit on the subjective clinometrics. They can be outstanding, but again, I wouldn't use them uh, for everyone. You need to have some real validation. If the person's had oscillopsia before, can they now read small font moving their head at two cycles per second? If they can, I don't care how they feel, they still have oscillopsia. So let's actually now look at the therapy we use. So I'm gonna show you a variety of different therapies with our, our team uh, and patients. So this is an easy table to look at because actually, and, and if you go to dizzy.com, this table exists in many of my textbook chapters and articles. You can download it, it's all free. So, I, I mean, you've got dozens and dozens of textbook chapters, articles, video, case studies, please, it's, it's there for you. But the reality of it is this one table pretty much is almost like an entire textbook. If you look in the blue on the left side, it looks at what the patient's functional impairments are. What are their primary complaints? Then the clinical findings that you can uh, assume you're gonna see with them. What kind of a condition, right, physiologically will cause this manifestation? And then there's your treatment protocols. And then finally, how do you measure your outcomes. Have, is the last four weeks of therapy, has it worked? And these are the measurements that you want to take. So let's make sure we understand what the definition of vestibular rehabilitation is. <coughs> Excuse me. It's a systematic progression of exercises and protocols. So we want to see the recovery of the gain of the VOR. Now, if you have V-hit, if you have rotary chair, guess what? We can demonstrate that. Will a caloric come back? No. Will a VEMP come back? No. But will the V-hit? Yes. Will the gain on rotary chair? Yes. But if you don't have those, you can do other things. You can do a simple dynamic visual acuity test. It's the simplest thing to do. We can look at a motion sensitivity index, right? I move my head a little bit. I feel like I moved a lot, right? I moved it slow, but to me it felt fast. That's a vestibular recruitment. And then ultimately, what do we want to do? We want to reset this gain. We want to put back the coordinated eye and head movement. And we want to help the patient recover equilibrium function. Now, that's critically important because unless you're dealing with a quadriplegic, this person is not just sitting in a chair doing this for the rest of their life. They're going to be active. They're going to be moving, right? So we have to be as aggressive in our therapy as the patient is going to be in real life. So let's take a little bit of a look at that. But before we do, the American Physical Therapy Association and their uh, uh, neurologic vestibular subgroup has made some recommendations. Now, do you have to follow them? Absolutely not. However, this is a gold standard, right? So this is all evidence-based. This is not just opinion. This is based on meta-analysis of hundreds of research papers. So you're entitled to do whatever you want, right? But here's the science, right? So if it's, a, if it's an acquired unilateral, there's two aspects. One is immediately out of the acute phase, and then there is the chronic phase. What you're going to see is, right out of the acute phase, they can't tolerate too much. So your sessions are gonna be much shorter. 
right? And we might only, if we need to, do some eye-only movement in the very beginning. As we go into the chronic, meaning they're well outside of the acute time, guess what? Our sessions become much longer as the person can tolerate it. And we want to move away from eye movement only because remember, the VOR is, is frequency sensitive. So we need to move the head at least at half a cycle per second for the VOR to kick in. Below that, it's our ocular motor performance, right? Now, for bilateral, we again can have a more, um, I'm going to say, aggressive or long-term issue. The key with bilateral patients are, remember, they are at very high fall risk. The acquired UVC, while they're at potential fall risk as you move into dynamics, is not nearly at risk as a bilateral. Remember, think of your peripheral vestibular system as gyroscopes. This patient has no gyroscope, which means gravity perception and motion perception. So now that we've placed the patient in the correct silos of what their functional impairments are, now we're going to decide what are we treating? Are we treating oscillopsia? Are we treating vestibular recruitment? Are we treating really a balance and gait dysfunction? Are we treating a patient that is deconditioned? Remember, by the time you see a patient that has kind of been immobilized or sedentary for days, weeks, or months, the older this patient is, the faster they're deconditioned. That's why if we put a 30-year-old in bed for a week or two, they can pretty much spring out of bed and, you know, get back to normal pretty easily. But by the time somebody's in their 60s or beyond, if you've had them in bed for two to three weeks, you have a problem. They're going to be deconditioned. So we always have to realize that we're not just treating patients from the neck up. So we have to also put together all of our therapy. What will our protocols look like, right? Do we have a collection of therapeutic activities specific for each of these conditions? I want you to think about this. That's why I call it, that's why back in the 90s, when I wrote my vestibular rehab book, I termed it diagnosis-based strategies. It's really like prescribing an antibiotic. I need to make sure that I, I've got a culture so I match the right antibiotic with the right type of bacterial infection. If I've got patients that have gait dysfunction, I'm going to have to put them on many, many different surfaces. I've got to challenge them in my clinic so that when they enter the real world again, there will be no surprises. We know what the benefits of the therapy is, right? For this particular group of patients, medication, surgery is not going to treat them. So we are going to have to use rehabilitation intervention to help them get their lives back. Once again, this is your, this if you will, is your pharmacy. And you're going to want to pick out and build the right, the perfect, the perfect composition of what this patient needs. 
Now, what we're going to show you is what we call a hybrid approach. Now, the reason that the hybrid approach, we believe, will give you the best and fastest results is that you really don't want to think, well, you know what, I think I'll just do for the first two weeks, I'll do gay stabilization. And then maybe, uh, you know what, I think in my third and fourth week, I'll move into vestibular recruitment and I'll do habituation. But wait, wait, how am I going to deal with substitution? So what we suggest, and you're going to see this in these vid videos in just a few minutes, is we're going to suggest that you take components of each of these based on the unique needs of the patient and introduce that. That will allow the brain to formulate the compensation and give them, if you will, the very, very strongest prescription as quickly as possible. But wait, there's another ingredient, and that's cognition. What is cognition? Cognition means that not only can the brain not fix what the brain cannot see, but it's critically important based on the research showing the changes in the brain's chemistry on PET scans, that when the therapy is being done, that you introduce activities that... Now, this cognitive challenge has to be specific to the individual, right? So if you are dealing with a individual whose socioeconomic uh, level is that, you know, all you can say is, what is your wife's name? What is your daughter's name? Okay, what is your address? Where do you live? When were you born? Then that's fine. But you may also have individuals who are at a level where you can do you know, how much is five plus six? How much is seven plus two? Uh, what is the capital of Germany? What is the capital of, of uh, uh, you know, of, of the UK? What, whatever it is. So what you want to do is you want to match the cognitive activity with the ind individual's ability. And again, there's many, many, many publications that have come out from investigators all over the world showing the importance of adding cognition to any activity you're doing. So look for the hybrid and then make sure that one of your ingredients is cognition. So what are some examples of cognitive tasks? Well, there's some of the ones that I just told you, but I'm gonna also uh, show you what uh, the Stroop test looks like, which is a lot of fun and easy to do. So this is an example of the Stroop test. So what you'll notice is the word, the written word is the same color as the word. So red is red, blue is blue. But look what happens when you get down to the third line. All of a sudden, the word blue is green and the word purple is red. So this takes what's called cognitive load. So you can play this game a variety of ways. You can ask the person to read the word or you can ask the person to, to name the color that the word is written in. This is just a simple example of a standardized a cognitive test that's really quite easy. Now, for children, you can do this with animals, right? So we can have, um, you know, we can have different animals. So we can have a, a red camel and a blue elephant, right? Those kind of things. We can have a, 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 a green rabbit. And so we can say, what is the animal or what is the color of the animal? So we can do things regardless of the person's literacy aspect or their age. So let's look at some uh, actual, in the time we have left, uh, let's look at some activities, right, that can enhance the recovery of the 
vestibular ocular reflex. And again, we in the for an acute person, we might do eye vision only, eye movement only. But we want to get off that as quickly as possible and get over to head movement. So remember, this is also based on the plasticity of the person's central nervous system. So if they're on antidepressants, if they're on other kind of medications that sedate the central nervous system, remember, the uptake of this software download might not be as efficient or as fast. Now, this adaptation can begin very, very quickly, but it is context specific. So the frequency of the head movement, the direction of the head movement, uh, all makes a difference. So let's take a look at some of these now. I want to move over to our videos. So what we're going to do is we're going to always use a stepwise progression. The key is we don't want to, as we say, burn daylight, meaning we don't want to waste time. If the person doesn't need eye movement only because they're not in an acute phase, don't begin there. We need to find the spot where the person's functional impairment is and move right into that area. So here's an example of a very simple activity, right? So the person is simply moving their eyes, usually at our command or with a metronome. But this is not what I would use for the typical vestibular patient. This would be somebody that maybe is only days outside of an acute debilitating attack. Again, we can use tracking activities, but we can add cognition. So as they're moving their eyes, right, we can ask them to read the word or name the color of the word, right? So let's see what that might look like. But as you can see, this is boring. It's boring and it's basic. This is certainly not a hybrid. This is what you do with somebody. This is what you might do with somebody that's still in hospital that hasn't been released yet. And this is all they can tolerate. So let's get a little bit more aggressive. This is what we would call times one. Right Now we might have to control the patient's head movement and we can control the speed of the head movement, right? We can use a metronome. So this is a fairly fast, this is almost two cycles per second. You might need to start out with a patient at only half a cycle per second. It depends again where their issue is. Now let's make it a little bit more complicated now, this is what we absolutely call a hybrid. What have I actually got here? This really is a hybrid activity. I've got the patient in a harness so they can't fall because this is a young, healthy person and I've got her standing on one foot on a dynamic surface, right? Now, would I jump from seated to this? Absolutely not. This is after progression. I would first have the person do this on the standing both feet, standing one feet, standing both feet on the sponge, then one foot on the sponge. This is a times two viewing. So now, this is a more complicated task, right? We're asking the patient to focus in the opposite direction that they're moving their head. 
if you have a patient that can't do this, they shouldn't be driving a car. They shouldn't be driving a lorry, right? They have to be very, very careful. So you have to realize that the activities need to match what's going to happen to the person when they go back into the real world. Again, a little bit more complicated, isn't it? This is a times two viewing. And again, we're probably going to play a metronome, right? So the person is moving their head so we can adjust the speed to progress them because slow to fast, right? But not too slow. How would I decide what speed based on their performance? If they're getting 100% at a speed, it's too slow. If they're getting 0% at a speed, it's too fast. I want to find that blend of success and failure. Again, we can go back to uh, cancellation. Again, this is a much easier activity and one that we would probably use with a patient in the acute phase or still in hospital. Again, targets indicates a higher level. The patient is moving their head. I can increase the frequency of the head movement and I can increase the complexity. So I might have a card with numbers. So I might have her just read the number or if I really want to be mean and she's a high level person, I might have her add the numbers. So she looks at a one, she looks at a five and tells me one and five is six. Now she looks at a two and a seven. Oh, two and seven is nine, you see? So I can change it based on the progression and the complexity of my patient. Again, this is a good example of a hybrid approach that you're going to see. The physio ball is one of the best inexpensive devices you can use because now I can stimulate the vertical proprioceptors and the horizontal with head movement. So I can minimize her vertical bounce or I can increase the vertical bounce. I can slow her horizontal head movement or I can increase the horizontal head movement. I can give her small fonts to read or large fonts to read. You see how we use the progression? Let's look at a target. Again, she's on a dynamic surface. Uh, number one, always, always keep the patient safe. You might have to put a gate belt on them. You might have to put them inside parallel bars. Not everybody has this apparatus, of course. But remember, many of my patients are athletes. They are pilots or they're just active people. Here's a go another good hybrid example. Trampoline is wonderful. So the person can walk in place. There's a little bit of dynamic bounce. Isn't that what you do when you walk down the street or walk through the market? But again, if you see there, Dr. Sakamura has got a gate belt on the patient, keeping the patient very safe. He's got cognition, she's reading, or following his commands. Now we can change the head movement. People are not just gonna move their head up and down or side to side. We're gonna move every direction that the head can move it. Why? Because you have 
six semicircular canals, and otolith mechanisms. We want to stimulate everything. And again, we can score this. If we're looking at the outcomes, we certainly can look at how does the oscillopsia behave? Are we extinguishing it? Habituation is about exposing the patient to the things that give them the prolongation of movement or enhanced movement even when they've stopped. So we have to understand what the patient's triggers are. And that's what we're going to do. What makes the patient dizzy? Speed, direction, or what else? Oh, I'm fine as long as I have my eyes closed. Oh, it's worse with my eyes open. Oh, if, if I, I, can't, I can't do this or I can't do that. That's what we're gonna do. So again, we're gonna use a progression based on what is provocative for the patient using a stepwise progression. Right. So again, movement of the head, focusing of the eyes. This is more easy because the patient is seated. But we know that when you're in a car, let's just say you're taking the bus home from work and you're trying to read your smartphone or you're trying to work on your computer or you're trying to read a book, a book, right? So we want to make this functional for the patient's life. But the reality of it is that patients are not always seated. So what do we have to do? Come on and move it, move it. Come on and move it, move it, right? So we have to make sure that the patient can manage their center of mass over a base of support with a narrow base of support, a wide base of support, a dynamic base of support. Now we can use technology like the computer you see behind, but for everyday therapy, you don't need the computers. That's great to measure outcome, but you don't need it for therapy. So let's look the last few we have, because we're running out of time, but let me show you. Sir, you, sir excuse me, you are not running out of time. You can, if uh, it needs a few more minutes, no problem. You can. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Just think about doing your laundry at home, pulling things out of a washing machine, picking up your baby, right? Everything, everyday activities. Technology, here's the good news. Technology cannot do the treatments. Your brain and your hands, your brain and your hands. You can see here, we are not really using technology for the therapy. Now, if you have virtual reality, which we do, I love virtual reality. Optokinetic stimulation. Remember, Alain Simon, back in the 1990s, taught us that optokinetic stimulation can reset VOR gain. So if you've got technology and you, you, know, you have it in your clinic, fabulous, use it. It, it's powerful, right? But if you don't, then these are the other techniques that you can use. If you go online and, and to dizzy.com, you'll see some of my video case studies of how we use virtual reality. But um, I, I don't always teach it because quite honestly, not everybody has it. Uh, so I try, to, I try to talk about things that everybody can have a gate belt, a piece of foam, a trampoline, right? 
real world activity, walking through the market, right? Walking through the streets. Now, she's not just doing this mindlessly. We may have a metronome. And I can, to, to prompt her to do the head movement. As she progresses and does better, I can change the font size of what she's reading. I can ask her to read the numbers. Tell me what the animal is. Tell me the color of the animal. Tell me the color of the number, right? So there's, I don't need a lot of things. I just need a few things and understand how to be creative. I mentioned optokinetics. Optokinetics are very, very powerful in helping to reset the VOR gain. More importantly, most of our patients will tell you that they are troubled by looking at moving objects, right? So again, if you have virtual reality or some sort of technology, phenomenal. If you don't, there are other things you can use. You can download some things on an iPad or a smartphone, right? Now this is not as powerful as an optokinetic virtual reality stimulation, but this therapy is one of the therapies that is being recommended for otolith dysfunction. So the page where, because this is a roll movement, which is stimulating the otolith organs, and of course, we're introducing an optokinetic. I can change the direction of the optokinetics, horizontal, vertical, and the speed. So what my goal is, if I'm doing habituation, number one, to decrease the intensity and to decrease, extinguish the sense of after motion. This is based on the patient's subjective report. Now I'm doing in one hour what we normally do in three days. I, so I mentioned we need to know what is the status of vision? What is the status of somatosensory, kinesthetic? Because vestibular can only work and help us if we understand what else is going on. Now, you've already seen the dynamic surfaces. Substitution is all about dynamic surfaces. Eyes open, eyes closed, surface conditions and um, also conflicting aspects, but always adding cognition. So let's go right to a couple of videos. This is similar to what you've seen. Again, now look at her feet, narrow stance. So I've got her in a difficult, challenging base of support on a dynamic surface. So this is a little bit higher level. Let me go to the videos. Here again, you can see the patient. We can change the speed at which she's rotating and the direction in which she's rotating. Now this is one of our last videos. This is called a task of executive control. This is a lot of fun. So what we're doing is when we put up four fingers, we're asking her to clap. When we put up five fingers, no clap. So four fingers clap, five fingers no clap. Now, in the perfect world, you would only do that with a patient that you feel comfortable can be by themselves. Otherwise, you'd need an assistant there with a, um, uh, with a gait belt on the patient, right? Again, gait with head movement, use a mat, use foam, 
very, very easy. You don't need a lot of technology to be able to accomplish this. Again, it's critical that you measure your outcomes. You can use a clinometric like dynamic uh, gait index, dizziness handicap inventory, dynamic visual acuity. But we strongly recommend, remember, repeating a VEMP won't do you any good. Repeating a caloric won't do you any good. Many of these people, by the time you get them, there was no spontaneous or provocable nystagmus. So you're gonna use other type of measurements to look at your outcomes. So remember, these are the things that you can do for vestibular ocular reflex, vestibular spinal reflex. As I mentioned, the beauty of vestibular rehab is if you have technology, wonderful. Virtual reality, optokinetics, balance systems, but to do the actual therapy, all you need, brain, hands, trampoline, gate belt, foam, your card preparations, and you can actually still produce great outcomes. Precautions, it's always a good idea to know what the underlying medical diagnosis was or the medical conditions. Doing this because you don't know what else to do is not science. That's voodoo. This is a science. Remember, Comorbidities will affect their outcomes. Medications and suppressants will affect the outcomes, okay? Many older adults, you have to be more genteel with them and you have to work within their physical limitations. The take home message of today's time, the brain can't fix what the brain can't see. So doing therapy that is not provocative, okay, will not help the patient. No movement, no improvement. Using concentrated tasks and attention in all your therapy will help. If the patient doesn't have a functional impairment, don't waste time trying to fix it, right? And if you didn't measure it, it didn't happen. So hopefully I didn't have to go too quickly for you. But what I would like you to do, I invite you to come to dizzy.com to get all of this. But I'm telling you something very exciting. July 1st, for the very, very first time, AIB will be offering its online international vestibular rehabilitation certificate. So everything we have been doing for 26 years in our three-day, 20-hour workshops, you will have available to you online. All the exercises, all the patient education, everything. And it's global. The, the workshops will be in uh, English, Mandarin, Spanish, and Portuguese. So hopefully you'll find this to be of interest. So again, I wanna thank NES. Um, I don't have to leave if you don't, so I'm more than happy to stay with you and answer any of your questions. Thank you, Dr. Gans. That was a beautiful, the most comprehensive uh, one hour lecture on vestibular rehabilitation ever delivered is uh, what uh, uh, I can uh, describe it as. And there have been a lot of comments uh, full of appreciation for uh, 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 the uh, present, uh, presentation. I do understand that this is something that you do over three days, which you um, somehow attempted and uh, uh, um, put it into one hour. And we'll have to relook at it uh, uh, many, many, many uh, times again uh, to uh, get more insights. And then, as you said, uh, the course uh, that uh, is coming up would be a great thing for people uh, uh, who want to go deep into this. So that is, uh, uh, as I note, it is on July. Uh, uh, on, July first. Yeah, on Ju July fourth or first. Uh, first, July first, one. First, okay, it fourth of July, on. Independence Day. So mm -hmm. before that, okay. Yes. Okay. Fine.
So uh, it's uh, been great. Before I take the questions, I would take the comments of uh, uh, Dr. Prem Sagar from All India Institute of uh, Medical Sciences, uh, who is in the uh, whose core interest is uh, vestibular uh, uh, vestibular and balance disorders. And then followed by that, I would uh, invite the comments of uh, uh, Dr. Anita Bandari. Dr. Prem Sagar. Hello. Dr. Prem. Fine. Can I have Dr. Anita Bandari? Yeah. Uh, so uh, thank you, Dr. Gans. Uh, it was a great lecture, great talk. Uh, we had met in Jodhpur. Um, and really enjoyed your session uh, there as well. Uh, I think what really uh, impressed me in your talk was uh, right from understanding uh, and e evaluating the patients to understand where the deficit lies, working on it with progressive rehab and finally measuring your outcome. I think that's the, that's the crux of the whole lecture. And that is how we can ensure that we have been able to achieve a good compensation. So thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Dr. Prem. You, you, you need to be a little more louder. Maybe the microphone you can come closer to the microphone. Yeah, it's better now. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Hello. No, we are not able to hear you, ma'am. Okay. Maybe by the time you fix uh, that, uh, I think I'll start taking some questions. Dr. Gab. Rema, ma'am, uh, please raise your volume. I think your volume is low. Your computer volume is low. Uh, my volume? No, no. no. Uh, Dr. Prema. Dr. Prema. Oh, yeah. You're perfect. <laughs> Yeah. So by then, I think I'll start uh, taking some questions uh, by the time ma'am uh, fixes uh, the volume issue. Uh, Dr. Gans, one of the questions which has been repeatedly being asked is, uh, uh, people with uh, 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 cerebellar disorders or probably a pedicular stroke, okay, rather than the peripheral, the central, especially the uh, fixed central disorder. So yeah. uh, what, what can we do about them? This, uh, this of course, has been one of the great challenges for many, many, many years. So um, remember, many of us, myself, Susan Herdman, uh, Sue Whitney, um, we've been working in vestibular rehabilitation uh, really since the uh, 1980s, the early 1980s. And one of the challenges has always been, what do you do with central patients? Well, here's what we know. And I, I use this as a metaphor. Vestibular rehabilitation for an acquired peripheral lesion is almost like downloading software to a computer. The hard drive is the patient's brain. We now know where the location of compensation occurs. It's in the cerebellum. It's in the vestibular nuclei, and we now know there's, it's also in the cortex. So depending on where the neurological event is, in essence, we may be trying to download this therapy into a broken hard drive. And just like a computer, if the hard drive cannot accept the software or run it properly, it's going to be challenging. However, anecdotally, what researchers have found 
is that in people with central phenomenon, that vestibular rehab probably 50% of the time seems to have benefit. Now, having said that, when you looked at the hybrid approach, it's just that. So what are we really doing? We're really doing physical therapy with them. We're doing cognitive therapy with them, right? And so we're conditioning them. So the reality of it is that vestibular rehabilitation is not just this. So when you use the hybrid, you're using kind of a shotgun approach and hoping that this collaboration of physical therapy, cognitive therapy, vestibular therapy is going to help the patient. Um, but I would not give up. Would I do it? Absolutely. But I would always do it with looking at what other impairments the stroke has left them with. So you, 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 would, you would offer uh, rehabilitation uh, for them. Okay. You would not give up. That's a great point. So, and um, one more question which has been being asked is, uh, it, it is a recurrent theme uh, being asked in different uh, ways. What do you do about motion sickness? migraine and triple pd all three okay. so you needed to find you needed to pick better parents <laughs> you can pick your friends you can't pick your parents so i've spent most of my work year my life my professional career working with the military um CIMS, chronic intractable motion sickness, we're talking about lifelong, not after acquiring it after a vertigo event. But this is your DNA. And we actually know that motion intolerance is genetic. Now, when you link it with migraines, two thirds of all migrainers are motion intolerant. There, uh, the research by Furman and Whitney has shown that even when migrainers are asymptomatic, meaning they don't have a headache, they can't tolerate vis over visual stimu stimulation. And that is why drugs like, uh, uh, you know, anti-seizure medications in low doses are being used sometimes to treat migraine prophylactically because in the neurology world, migraine, migraineurs are thought to have overactive brains. They're hyperstimulated. So usually the best thing for motion intolerance is anti-motion drugs, anti-emetics. The problem is then you may not be able to function the way you want. Now, over the years, we have tried to desensitize patients. You know, oh, if I, I wish I could read in the car. I wish I could look at my smartphone on the bus, but that movement of trying to do that is too much for the individual. Some people get some benefit from desensitization or habituation, but most people do not find it very, very helpful. They're challenging populations. Okay, sir. Then there, there is one more question. If it is in the field and somebody says, I am dizzy, do you, is there something that you can do then and there on the field to say whether the person needs to come to you? Um, can you repeat again the first part of the question, please? There's a question. If you see some person, like, like if, if, you are, if, if you are attending a common friend's wedding and uh, then there somebody comes and says, then is there something you can do then and there to decide whether the person needs to come to you? You know, the old joke is, do you have insurance? That's what you would say in the United States. Uh, <laughs> but the reality of it is, we have seen children for free for 28 years. We do all the pediatric work with Johns Hopkins at the Children's Hospital here. We've, we've never turned away anybody in 28 years. So we see everybody. 
Uh, but seriously, I would begin to have the conversation because it's really a clinical pathway, right? Yeah. My first question is, right, did you have an attack of vertigo and now you feel dizzy? If they say, oh yes, about six months ago, I don't have any more vertigo, but I'm just not right. Perfect patient. If the person says, oh, well, you know, I, I have, I'm diabetic, uh, I'm hypertensive, they can't my, get my medications right, I, I can't control my blood pressure, and I just feel dizzy all the time. I would encourage them to go back to their family doctor or their whoever is treating them and say, well, have you had this discussion with them? We certainly can have you come and see us. But from what you're telling me, it might be an underlying medical condition. So I do a little clinical pathway in okay. my interview of the patient. Doc, I think Dr. Prem Kadar is back. Uh, she can make her comments and also questions. Can you hear me now? Oh, oh yeah. that's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Richards, for a very elaborate uh, talk. Uh, Thank you so much. Um, I really learned about uh, including incorporating the cognitive aspect during the rehabilitation process. Uh, I want to discuss about one difficult case that I really faced and uh, I am right now in a fix but how to treat this patient. Can I go ahead? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So he is a, a 62 year male with uh, diabetes so bilateral diabetic uh, uh, retina retinopathy so severely reduced vision he had tuberculosis in the past so now there is recurrence of tuberculosis so because of the tuberculosis and the anti-tubercular medications his uh, both side hearing is gone and bilateral vestibulopathy he has developed bilateral vestibular weakness now, how to rehabilitate the patient who is not having, you has severely reduced vision and no hearing at all? Pray. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, for patients like that, look, we have to understand that we're not gods. Oh, you, you know, if you were in a casino, you would say you have to play the hand you're dealt. Uh, these are the most difficult patients. And this is when we look at what we call activities of daily living. Yes. How do we keep the patient safe? Can they get on and off a toilet? Can they get in and out of bed? If they live alone, can they prepare uh, food for themselves? Um, uh, what can we do in the house to make them safe? If they're going outside of the house, uh, a cane is not good. They need a walker. They need a wheeled walker. They're going to need assistive devices. Um, you've, you, you, you're going to have to, this is not a vestibular rehabilitation patient. This is one of the patients that just needs to be kept safe and alive and it's about quality of life for them. Yeah. Dr. Anita Bandari, you would have, have something to add to that? Yeah, I, I also had a, so uh, this I understand would be an extremely, extremely difficult uh, patient to deal with. But uh, sometimes we get patients, uh, maybe of bilateral or unilateral vestibular loss, who after your uh, rehab, maybe down the line, six weeks or eight weeks down the line, and you see they're pretty okay. Uh, and then maybe after five months, six months, they again start having the unsteadiness or the dizziness. So what could be the reasons for the, these patients perhaps decompensating? That, that actually is quite common. Um, there's actually quite a bit of literature that looks at the uh, long-range benefit of balance but I'll say balanced retraining therapy. And it's actually not good. Um, what typically happens to these patients is they have other comorbidities and they backslide. So they do, they do pretty well in therapy, 
but then they go home and they become sedentary and they don't move around much and they maybe they're laying on the couch or they're uh, they baby themselves and they start to backslide that's why if you look at the longitudinal studies that shows the best long-term results it's usually with older adults that incorporate uh, weight training and resistance training, yoga, uh, stretching activities, Pilates, but some type of activity. Um, and again, forms of yoga can be very, very helpful, but you cannot just discharge these people and wish them good luck. Basically, they're going to have, a, they need to maintain this for the rest of their lives because that, that bilateral dysfunction is not coming back. Uh, and there's also some, we do a lot of work with diabetics. Uh, and what we, there, there's a lot of research that actually shows on computerized dynamic posturography on the Equitest that you can predict if they're having a good day or bad day based on their sugar levels. When their glucose is a problem, bad day. So we can educate the diabetic patient who's monitoring their, their levels to, to warn them that on days when your sugar is up and it's not controlled, these are days you've got to be very, very careful because you're more, more prone for a fall on those days. So we again, we have to continue to look at the gestalt of the patient. And all too often, I, I think all of us are guilty as vestibular experts. Oh, what did the what did the caloric show? Let, I want to look at the nystagmus. You're missing the gestalt of the human being. Yep. The, uh, now, what has happened in the last, uh, in, in the past few years is we have all become excellent diagnosticians. Okay, so we are able to catch the clinical diagnosis or the name. Uh, the, uh, the next big bridge to be crossed for all of us is the rehabilitation part of it. And I think it's a big, big start today with uh, your lecture. There is one question. There are two things. I will uh, add all the three in one. You will handle them. One is in India. We are real estate constrained. Your setup looks huge for us, especially for the ENT department, even in large corporate hospitals, they don't give the second room. Okay, that is our problem. So how do we, how do we help patients with space constraints? One. Two is, uh, I'll ask all three questions simultaneously. Two is specifically for fall risk people, is there one word that you have to tell one, two precautions that you have to tell? Like you, I like your words when you say, no, uh, what the brain can't see, the brain can't fix. No movement, no improvement. Similar to that, is there anything for the fall patient that you have to say these two things? I'll come to the next question later. Yes. All right. So let me answer your second question. Gravity always works. Gravity always wins. So as you know, many of these patients, oh, I'm careful. Oh, I, I, no, no, I'm, I'm careful. I'll hold on to things. Uh, you know, or they, they're with a significant other. This is always funny. You've got a big tall guy, right? That's, you know, uh, two meters. And the wife is barely one and a half meters. And he's, She's his, she's holding on to, right? And you say, you know, you're both, you're not stronger than gravity. So, no, don't tell them that they have to change their spouse. Yes, no, no. You, you need to find a, a taller wife. <laughs> you have to start feeding your wife more. Uh, but seriously, gravity always works and gravity always wins. Um, there is the belief that, oh, I'm fine, I'm careful, you, right? So what we do, because most people still fall in their home, right? Particularly in the bathroom 
and in the kitchens, right? So what we try to do is even in their kitchen, which is, a, is rearrange your kitchen if you have to. Don't put things way up on the shelf. Try to have things, your, the things you use every day that are somewhat eye level to you. So you don't have to go reaching or stretching um, because that does two things. One, vision is not giving you a horizon. And two, you're probably shifting your center of gravity in such a way that your base of support is not equal. The other thing is, what are you wearing on your feet? Now, I know that India, many parts of India right now is like Florida, probably pretty warm, right? And a lot of us go barefoot. In my house, I never wear shoes. I'm, my wife and I are always barefoot in our house, right? So you have to be careful of the footwear that people are wearing. Sometimes they think, oh, I have a pair of Reeboks or I have a pair of Adidas and they think because it's a sport shoe, it's gonna be good for them. It's not, because it's too high and too soft, you can't feel the ground. So having a discussion about what they're doing at home, how their home is set up, right? Can they put a grab bar or something by the toilet, by their shower, uh, what kind of footwear they wear, they're using? These things are very important. Yeah, so I think that, that answers uh, uh, Dr. Ramesh Rohival's question, the instructions. So rearrange your kitchen, uh, make sure what you wear at home, and then rearrange the place so that gravity is going, always works, gravity always wins. So make sure that when it wins, we don't have a problem. The other thing is, I will tell you, is because of your common dress, women wearing a sari, they actually have to be very careful that their foot doesn't get stuck in the hem in the bottom of it. Okay. Which I'm sure you, you yes. have people falling and tripping all the time. So yep. they do have to be cognizant of these. And, and you know, as people age, they have to make modifications. Now, to answer your question about the space, mm -hmm. yes, our space is large, but you don't need that. All you really need is a corner of a room. All you really need is a corner of a room. Now, why do I like the corner? Because, I mean, here I'm in this office, I'm right here. So I can take the, if you saw those big blue mats, I can take some sort of foam and mat and wrap it in the corner. So literally, if I have a space, eight by eight, I don't maybe three meters by three meters. Yeah, that should be enough. It's really enough. You can do quite a bit because yeah. you're not going to have all the equipment there at one time, yeah. right? So what should you have? The mats, the, a nice foam that really does sink, a trampoline, the physio ball. Now the physio ball, you probably need different sizes because if a guy is two meters, he needs a bigger ball because otherwise he's, right? But if you have a small person, you need the smaller ball, right? If you have, um, you know, like your optokinetic system with some technology, that's easy enough. Maybe it's, you put it on the laptop and now you've got the goggle on and you can do some treatment with that. You can, add the impact because I know you have a great optokinetic system, right? You take that optokinetic and now you've got, I'm gonna stand up, right? The person is wearing the, the goggle, yeah. but now you've got them in the belt and you've got them on the phone and you've got them doing circle sways and all these activities while they're wearing the goggle. You can have on, on the trampoline, in the goggle, and higher level moving their head. So you can, you can then take the technology and marry it yes. to low technology and boom, 
really kick up the impact of everything. All in the corner of one room. <laughs> you really can. Yeah. Right? Think, think about how big a, a, a trampoline is yes. or the physio ball. The main thing is to keep the patient safe. So, so I, I kiddingly say, make your corner like it's a psychiatric hospital. <laughs> pad the walls, yeah. pad the floor, and you can, you can do virtually everything in there. Yeah. Now, if you're going to ambulate with a patient, mm -hmm. put a gate belt on them, walk them through the hallways, take them outside the building, yeah. right? Uh, put them in the gate belt and walk them on the grass, walk yeah. them on the steps, right? That's what, you would, that's what we do in physical therapy. Yes. One more question, sir. The mic microphone that is there in front of you, is that a AT or? Ah, what is yeah. that? It's a Yeti. Yeti, yeah. That's wonderful. Looks like you're, you already started preparing for the online uh, courses. Oh, well, interesting. It's an enduring course. It's not live. Okay. So you can stop it and start it whenever you want. Okay, it's, okay, okay. okay. Yeah. So you are recorded using the AT, I think. That my staff did. Uh, it's, it actually teaches quite a bit. Okay, okay. Fine. I think that was a wonderful session. There is one question here on the dizzy.com website. Uh, as of now, the status is that that course is not showing up. On what? Dizzy.com? No, international? You're saying it's not showing up? Yes, it's not showing up is what is it? No, let me let me see. That's unusual. It no, I saw somebody uh, messaging the chat the chat uh, box that uh, it's not showing. Yeah, it, it is. Tell them to try it again. Okay, it is. So, so whoever asked that question, it is there. Okay, on your screen that it is there. Okay, yeah. okay. thank you, sir. So, I think yeah. uh, it was a it, yeah, it's there. It's there. Beautiful. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think it's nine o'clock. Uh, uh, there is so much that we can discuss. Okay, uh, course itself is a three-day course. Then we tried to do something in uh, one and a half hour, and um, I. Thank uh, Dr. Gans for uh, for taking time out uh, to and accepting the uh, invitation of uh, uh, NES uh, India and uh, gracing uh, this uh, us with his uh, presence. And I also thank um, our panelists, uh, Dr. Anita Bandari and uh, Dr. Prem Sagar. Thank and uh, I thank the entire. Uh, of course, most of the questions were directed to Dr. Gans for the one reason that all of us keep meeting. So he is one person who is not that. To, Go. So that is why most questions were there. I hope my panelists will not uh, mind that. Then, um, yes. Yeah. No problem. We also wanted to ask some uh, questions. Yeah, thank you. I thank, thank you. Uh, everybody in the NES team uh, um, from Dr. Suratwala, Dr. Mohan, um, uh, Pawan, sir, and uh, Dr. Amit. There are two Amits. Okay. Then, uh, so everybody. I uh, thank uh, uh, Dr. Kshitij. Okay, so every I, th I thank all of us for this uh, wonderful uh, uh, evening. If I missed some name, it is just uh, maybe too much close to the heart, so we sometimes miss. Okay, so good night to everybody. So Dr. Prahlad, Dr. Prahlad, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. It is because of him that we have this Zoom. Uh, oh, wonderful! Uh, thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Stay safe. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.